outline before we start getting into the agenda. So we will follow up on some questions and some comments that we received both at the first work session as well as uh, follow up uh, in the days that followed the first work session. And then we'll get into the topics of tonight's meeting. We will talk to you about your walkability projects that are uh, included in the budget ordinance. We'll also talk about the property management projects that are included in that ordinance to give you an idea of how much fund balance you have um, to work with and how much fund balance this budget ordinance is proposing to use. We'll have a presentation on your general fund fund balance. And then we'll open it up as we do every work session for any public input and then open it up to the board for any questions or comments or requests that if we can't answer tonight, we'll circle back and we'll be prepared to answer at your uh, third and last scheduled work session on Thursday of next week. So starting off with tonight's overview, wanted to provide some follow-up to the first work session. One of the comments that was raised in the first work session was a concern about being able to find information in the budget. There was also some concerns that we, I think, generated uh, through confusion about the difference between uh, requested budgets and recommended budgets. And so I want to revisit uh, specifically the wayfinding project and um, to help answer some of the confusion that we introduced, but also to help further refine why we talked to you about requested and recommended budgets. And then finally, we've got some follow-up regarding the alley activation project that came up as specific questions in the first work session. So as far as how to find information in the budget, um, I've titled the next few slides as navigating the budget. This page A1, this is your budget at a glance. This is gonna identify where your operating revenue is coming from. It's going to identify where your operating revenue is going to. So when I say where the operating revenue is going to, it's going to let you know what departments that revenue is going to. This also tells you about the capital revenues, but the details on the capital revenues as far as the individual funding streams and the projects that they are going to is in the recommended capital budget section. For as big a document as this is, these five pages right here are all you are gonna be voting on on June 7th. And so what we are trying to do is we're trying to get you to understand what we have put into this budget. Now, you may like what's in the budget and you may adopt that and that's okay with us. You may not like what's in the budget. But what we wanna do is put you in a position where you can, if you don't like what's in there, you have enough information where you can revise it. What we don't wanna do is have a competition where it's our budget versus your budget. It's your budget. We're just trying to get you educated on it so either you're good with it or you have enough information where you can modify it. When it comes to the recommended operating budget, so that's gonna be in section B. This is the budget that is being recommended to the board. It does not re represent everything that a department requested. That is in section C. And I'm highlighting the police department in particular because you should know that that department requested two police officers, this recommended budget because of funding constraints recommends one police officer to be funded at mid-year. And so I wanna make sure that it's very clear with the board that what was request, what is being recommended is not what was requested. So we're trying to be transparent. And then finally in, this is the capital budget, at the bottom of the last page of section E, you're gonna see a pie chart there. And that, talk, and that shows you where the revenue is coming from and where it's going to within the capital budget. This I think is gonna be useful for you is, for example, if you want to change a scope of a project or you wanna drop a project, it can let you know what funds have been freed up and what funds can then be applied to a different project. There are some projects in here that are funded by restricted revenue. And so if you drop a project and those funds then become available, you can only use it for certain purposes. So that's probably the biggest um, practical use of this chart is to know if you free up funds by dropping a project and, and those funds are restricted, you're gonna be restricted in what you can use it for as an alternate project. Does it show somewhere 
in section E, what ones are restricted and what ones are not? Yep. So welcome to the world of staff of having to uh, work with me. Let's see if I can go back. You will see in uh, section uh, in section E, the let me break it out for you. Those revenue streams are color coded. Right, but none of them say restricted. I'm getting ready to oh, okay. explain that. Okay, if you go to the last page, which is E8, go to the bottom of the page and you'll see revenue sources. And those revenue sources have a color-coded background. Those revenue sources that have the purple background, those are restricted. Just the light purple? Yes. All right. So when you go over the pie chart, it says fleet expenditures. That's dark purple, but that's completely different. Yeah, that's that's where the that's yeah that's just expenditures. Okay. The, the revenue if, if it has purple, that indicates that that's a restricted revenue source. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. All right, as far as uh, one of the items specifically that came up in work session one, we did, uh, I specifically did a good job of making it confusing. The requested budget for wayfinding is not what you saw for recommended. And it could and probably came across that we changed the scope, but the scope wasn't changed. What the reality is, is that we are a very lean staff and so we are putting um, staff into positions that they're probably not used to. So each of us have a strength, and, and my particular strength is I've got an awful lot of experience in design and construction. And because I've constructed a wayfinding project, I know that the, the revenue estimate or the expenditure estimate that was put forward to you is not going to be adequate. And the reason I say that is you'll see in the in memo for the wayfinding that the average price for the signs is around $6,600. That's probably a good price, especially when you take a look at some of the wayfinding that has been done by municipalities around us. But that's going to be representative of, if you look at the cursor, of a sign like that. It's not going to be adequate to, um, to reflect the cost for the interchange wayfinding signs that is proposed in here. Based on my experience, those could range from anywhere between $10,000 and $12,000 a piece. And if you do two at each interchange, actually the budget is not going to be enough to, to fund that. So I just want to be real clear that the <coughs> scope is the same, it's just that the, the estimate was bumped up because those interchange signs, if you choose to do it, are much more expensive. The other reason uh, to show the change is I doubt in this job market, in this construction market, that you're going to get anyone to show interest in a project that is for 36000 It's probably going to have to be at least 50000 to sh to get someone who's interested. So that's the other reason for the revision in the estimate. Um, we had one other follow-up item from work session one, but let me just check in to see if there's any questions on the wayfinding in particular. Okay. Um, we had a question about alley activation before I turn that, before I turn it over to Sheila, um, who's also going to then roll into talking about walkability. Let me share with you because you're going to see this in Chris's presentation. There are items that we will briefly talk about, which are future projects. And those are just to give you a heads up. We'll talk in greater detail at a, at a later time about that. Um, those are also mentioned just to let you know that the budget you've got is just this year, but it's a part of a continuum, so don't spend all your money this year. You've got to be thinking about projects for the future, but that's why we talk about future. But again, as I mentioned with the police position, we're going to talk to you about projects that are unfunded. And we just took a risk analysis, and some of the things that we thought were going to be higher probability of risk, 
we put into the recommended and those that we thought were going to be a lower probability of risk, we did not recommend. But they still could possibly be needed this coming year. So that's why we wanted to share with you the unfunded. But that's not to be confused with the future project. So with that, I will turn it over to Sheila to talk about alley activation as well as walkability. Good evening, Mayor and members of the board. Um, thank you for giving me this opportunity to follow up with you about our alley activation discussion from last week and uh, some requests to um, determine additional costs to provide uh, 50 amp service on um, the 200 block of, of Rendell Avenue in our downtown. But I wanted to first take the opportunity to recognize our board and um, our community for um, being uh, or, or for getting the support from um, Congressman David Price. Uh, so we submitted a request uh, to the community um, project um, appropriation fund and uh, we are fortunate for the fourth district. Uh, our project was selected to uh, be recommended uh, to the um, federal budget review committee uh, for funding. So it's not solidified, but I do think um, it is important to recognize that others see the value in your strategic plan and in the work that you have already begun. Uh, and this uh, request was for about $700,000 and the request included uh, continuing alley activation it included um, some wayfinding specific to our downtown and support of our downtown businesses. Uh, it included public art as well as acquiring um, property downtown for parking uh, and some kind of lower scale electrical infrastructure work. So there's a lot piled into that 700,000. It will go very quick. Uh, we won't know probably until the fall if it is funded, but um, I do think it's important to recognize you guys for um, the support of these projects and your vision and that other people um, support it as well. Uh, so with that, I wanted to follow up. There was a request um, on what it would cost to do a 50 amp um, access and if we had capacity um, on the 200 block, and so we do have capacity to pull in um, a 50 amp service um, from, we have um, support on Sycamore Street that services on a rental, and so we do have the power, uh, or enough power uh, service there to pull in another 50 amp service. Uh, so the cost of uh, one additional um, 50 amp service would be uh, approximately $4,000. Um, so, and that includes a little bit of contingency. Uh, this is a little bit of a wild construction market right now. Uh, so we are just including uh, a little bit of um, contingency in that project as well. So we do feel, uh, as long as everything goes smooth, again, like I said, it's a little bit of a wonky um, construction world. So uh, we feel confident that we're gonna be able to do the existing scope and have remaining funds to move forward with the existing budget that we've provided us um, for alley activation and downtown electrical infrastructure. So um, we think we'll be able to do that. And um, as I mentioned last week, we'll be looking to roll over funds that are budgeted in this year to next year to be able to fund uh, that project in addition to beginning our journey into Wi-Fi in our downtown. So if you have any questions, happy to answer those. Okay. So now we're going to go into uh, Walk Zebulon. 
So uh, this is a committee uh, this year. It was uh, Planning Director Mike Clark, Public Works Director uh, Chris Ray, and myself. And um, as we start with any process, we look to uh, our strategic plan and we try to identify how our committee fits into our strategic plan. Uh, so for vibrant downtown, um, projects that we look at are activation and um, connection of alleys, uh, identify ways to slow traffic in our downtown so that uh, we have a more walkable downtown. Uh, we also have small town life, and so uh, specifically noted in small town life was that you wanted to improve walkability. Uh, we talked about activating alleys in your um, budget retreat uh, last year, and we're not your but your um, board retreat last year, and uh, connect uh, connecting North Arundel and surrounding residential neighborhoods uh, to downtown. Uh, and we talked about that in our budget process last year, and you've seen that already uh, moving forward this year. Uh, growing smart, so implementing wayfinding and branding. Uh, we've talked about how that uh, walkability ties into your wayfinding. Uh, traffic mitigation, as well as attracting private investment. So a review of um, the current budget year. Uh, so we focused on that connection of Arundel Avenue and the residential area there to our downtown. And so uh, you, we focused on the missing links on Arundel Avenue. So we did the um, section of missing sidewalk from Gannon to Lee. We also did our first stamped crosswalk at North Street. Um, and let's see. So for Walt Zebulon, uh, in addition to our strategic plan, um, part of Growing Smart is um, working with our community uh, to help make our plans. And so in 2019, I'm not going to go in a lot of detail about that study because we've talked about it in a work session and uh, throughout uh, the past year or two. But I just wanted to highlight the things that stood out that helped guide us to the project that we're recommending for this year. And uh, so in 2019, when we reached out to our community members, we heard that the biggest barriers to walking uh, were the lack of sidewalks, the amount of traffic, and driver habits. Uh, when we asked where people wanted to walk to, um, what destinations, we heard downtown, parks, restaurants, and shopping. And we also heard that people wanted to see us connect gaps, and again, we heard downtown uh, in further questioning. Uh, you also heard in a work session, uh, we had uh, some downtown stakeholder discussions uh, last fall, um, early winter, and the hot topics that were discussed with you um, that were shared by those um, stakeholders in those conversations included walkability, parking, and destination development, and so we tried to combine a lot of this knowledge that we've received from our community members and how it fit into a strategic plan uh, to come up with some goals as we worked forward through our Walt Zebulon proposal. So the goals that we um, wanted to um, accomplish with our walkability project, uh, the first one is to address gaps in sidewalk around downtown. We also wanted to maximize connectivity opportunity and support downtown development efforts. So why would we focus on downtown? And I, this may be some difficult to see on your screen, um, but I think these two images are very telling. Um, these are also images that we used as uh, we made our proposal to um, Congressman David Price. Um, so the image on your left shows the lines in yellow are where you currently have sidewalk or um, walkable um, surfaces around your downtown. And so what you'll see is where you are completely missing sidewalk is on the western side of Sycamore Street. So there's still some gaps um, on the other side streets, but that street is completely missing sidewalk opportunity. And so that's where we started to shift our focus, but we also recognized there were some service opportunities. Um, there are access to um, faith-based um, Start or opportunities, there's access to um, services that would support uh, some of our families that are in the surrounding neighborhoods um, and in the housing authority uh, in a walkable manner. 
Uh, we also recognize that as Gannon continues to get busier and busier, uh, as we want people to walk to our downtown and through our downtown, giving them a more walkable opportunity off of that busy road uh, would be a safer option uh, as well as an easier option for the walker. And so that's another reason why we look to that Sycamore Street. Uh, the image on your right uh, is an image that we worked with our planning department. And so we work to recognize what are the housing units, the dwelling units, in a walking distance of our downtown. And, and then uh, what are the values of those homes? And so what you'll see is the homes that are a lighter shade of green are homes of a lower value and the ones of the darker shade are they're increasing and um, you also will see in the shades of blue and purple within this walking distance which is 0.3 miles of our downtown those are subsidized housing and housing authority properties so in total there are 326 housing dwelling units as well as 75 um, that would fall in that subsidized um, and housing authority units and so we wanted to make sure that we are working in succinct with our downtown development efforts um, to provide this catalyst for um, access to not just your parks and not just downtown but access to services access to food and most importantly access to jobs so our hope is to create an environment um, that will attract investors, that will bring job opportunities for those that could benefit the most um, from the job opportunities that we could bring in. Uh, another thing that you will see is there are a total of 57 public parking spaces on Sycamore Street. And uh, so that includes the west and eastern side of Sycamore Street. And that's something that we hear a lot of is that there's a challenge with parking in our downtown. Um, if we fully recognize the amount of side street parking that we have and we use directional signage, we've seen some smaller scale directional signage go up, uh, but that will help. Um, educating and creating an environment that feels walkable will be more inviting for um, parking for people to use those side streets as public parking uh, so that is another reason uh, why you saw uh, or why we gravitated towards the corner street uh, so the next slide here just shows the the area that we're talking about so we are looking uh, at this block of uh, West Sycamore um, from Zebulon Drug to the church. And then we're also looking at doing a stamped um, crosswalk at this intersection of Arundel and uh, Sycamore. And I'm just gonna um, recap just in case I left anything out on why we feel these improvements are important. Uh, so we want to create strong visual indications of pedestrians for through traffic, such as tractor trailers. Uh, you're having, uh, increasing your walkability, increasing that pedestrian traffic will do that naturally, but as well as having those visual barriers such as uh, the stamped crosswalk will help. I'm not saying it's going to fix your problem 100%, but it helps add to that visual indication that you are going to have pedestrians in this area. Uh, we want to continue connections to services such as the food pantry at Zebulon United Methodist Church for residents living at nearby affordable housing communities. We want to enhance walkability to dwelling units near downtown. We want to highlight available on-street public parking available to downtown workers and visitors. Create and encourage alternative routes to walking on busier streets such as Gannon and help enhance walkability to services located in and surrounding the downtown core. Uh, so this section of West Sycamore um, from Arundel to Church, um, it includes uh, sidewalk installation, accessible and stamped crosswalks, and the total estimated cost is $315,000.
In addition to Sycamore Street, uh, we also are recommending uh, that we move forward with an ADA uh, transition plan. Uh, we would like to bring in um, a consultant to help us with that. You've probably recently see this is a project that Window um, has uh, been undergoing uh, most recently. Nightdale, I believe, did it last year. Uh, so this is uh, something that is required by the federal government. Uh, you are going to see, we're hearing an awful lot of chatter <coughs> in the grant world uh, with some of our um, comrades uh, that help with those uh, processes that we anticipate having an up-to-date ADA transition plan is almost certainly going to be required for future funding. Uh, so as we go after federal funding and state funding, uh, you're going to see more than likely requests for that. Very similar to the part if process, they expect to see a Parks and Recreation Master Plan uh, when you're applying. So um, it's something that is the right thing to do um, as we want to be more accessible and inclusive in our community, but it is also something that as we grow, uh, we're going to need to seek funding partners for our projects. Um, so what this process will do, it'll review town assets, identify ADA concerns, and provide us recommended actions and estimated um, costs to address those. Uh, so we expect that project to come in at about $15,000. Uh, and as Joe mentioned, um, we would like to just give you an idea because our CIP uh, process, you know, that P stands for plan. And so we want to be able to establish a plan for the years to come of uh, what walkability uh, could uh, look like for our community. And so some of the projects that we've recommended for the future, and again, these always, it's a working, the plan is working, so they can always be addressed based on feedback that we get throughout the year and during the budget process. Um, East Vance Street from the Housing Authority uh, to the Post Office um, is an area that we think um, should uh, be considered for uh, sidewalk opportunity. Uh, there's also a sidewalk repair on the 200 block of East Horton Street. One of the reasons you're not seeing that move forward fairly quickly is because as you do a streetscape plan, that might be something that you would tie in um, to that process. Uh, pedestrian signal improvement, so Arundel Avenue and Vance Street is one area we would like to see signal improvements as well as Arundel Avenue and Gannon. Um, the Arundel Avenue in Gannon, there's just some tie up in kind of what that intersection is going to look like in the future. So we know that something needs to be done there and we would like to see that move forward as soon as possible. Uh, and we've also um, included stamped asphalt in our downtown corridor and leading to it. Um, and we've talked about this, I'm not going to go in, in too great detail, but it is one of those things that if we say we want to be a walkable community and we say we want to attract investors, um, these are things, they're like that amenity um, that people are looking for and it raises the bar on the caliber of investor that we're wanting to bring to our community. So when they see things like that, it makes them think, you know, wow, this is what I'm going to expect in working in this community and um, it, it just kind of elevates uh, that potential partnership that we could have. And I'm available to answer any questions. Could you uh, elaborate a little bit more on this sidewalk <clears throat> from Arundel to Church Street? That just seems like an excessive amount of money. Yeah. <coughs> Give me just one moment to pull my cost estimate out. I'll do the best I can to answer the question, and then I may refer, just give you a heads up, Chris, I may refer to you to help. Um, so part of that uh, cost estimate, about 60000 of that, is for um, engineering designs and permitting. Um, part of why we'll need some engineering designs is because we're going to be working within um, or close enough to uh, Arundel Avenue, and so as we work with NCDOT, we're going to be required for certain sections to have engineered drawings. We're required to, I'm sorry. We're going to be required to have engineered drawings as we work with NCDOT for encroachment agreement, agreements as we get close to Arundel Avenue. Um, we also will have to include um, some surveying, surveying project oversight um, 
uh, there's going to be just kind of demolition of the area that we're going to want to install um, the concrete. Uh, there's going to be some traffic control measures. Um, we're going to have to relocate some uh, utility uh, boxes and manholes, uh, relocate some signs, uh, as well as, um, you know, part of your cost is going to be, you know, your stamped um, crosswalk as well. Well, isn't there some sidewalk already there? Not on West Sycamore. Uh, I There's thought that there was beside do for him for example and uh, the drugstore as well it's right just right there at that corner of the drugstore is really all you've got but doesn't that pull you off of a rental which is the state road yes that would but if you're going to be doing the sycamore street or um the stamped crosswalk you're going to have to have engineer drawings to work with ncdot so do you have to have that if you paint crosswalks or do you have to have it if you stamp <coughs> crosswalks? It's my understanding, Chris, you can help me out, but it's my understanding if we're doing anything within that space of the um, encroachment area of NCDOT's road that we're going to have to have um, engineer drawings. And Chris, yeah, he's nodded that I've had to, we would have to have that. For any type of just painting? That, that just seems excessive. We, we, we have to get a person to do There is a, we just tried it. There's a chance they might be able to uh, take a person. Chris, to Chris. Any type of can, can you step to the podium for it? Yeah. <laughs> you know you got to get it up. Early. If we stamp it, it's got to be engineered. There's not a doubt in my mind. If we just put thermoplastic crosswalk striping, they may tape an application from it myself. But any, even some of the other small stuff that we've talked about uh, in the past, when I've talked to the district engineer, they want to see engineer drawings. Uh, they will not accept, um, you know, something from a non-licensed engineer, even uh, something as simple as you know a couple hundred linear feet of sidewalk uh, we tried to look at north rendell avenue just past year because we had some small sections and we just done a block um, they required they said that was not acceptable for us to even come in and do it ourselves they required engineer drawings well wouldn't it be uh, less expensive an engineering cost if we were not doing and i thought look i like stamping so don't yeah, yeah, yeah. read between the lines on me okay yeah. But what I'm concerned about is is the cost. Yes. Oh, absolutely. And uh, I think what you're seeing is a, a, a reflection of the construction market. It is extremely expensive right now. We also like engineering drawings that allow us to go out to bid, just so people have something to bid upon, have known quantities, elevations, make sure our grade, grades are, are correct. Um, so that is our pretty much standard procedure for something of this magnitude is to have engineered drawings for bidding, as built, um, insurance degrees are right in compliance with uh, ADA standards, and then of course NCDOT is the piece on the, on the ice well, on the top. Along those same lines, though, it seems like a couple of years back we did ADA slopes at those sidewalks. Yeah, at the crosswalks at uh, Rendell, yeah, the, those handicap ramps are there. Yes, those are in place, those will be fine. We will not need to make any adjustment to them. Um, is the any other ones that we're going to make on Church Street or crossing the alley there that um, used to go to, it goes to the back of um, what's the drugstore now? I can't remember what it is there. I know where you're yeah. talking about. But so there's several crosses through there, um, bidding quantities, all those things. It's just standard procedure for us to have engineered drawings and stuff that for, for bidding purposes. And then, of course, getting out DOT, milling, stamping, et cetera. Well, I understand that milling and stamping cost a lot more. I get mm -hmm. that. We also have in the, in the project, I will tell you, due to our limited staff, we do have we're outside, outsourcing construction inspection that will be all done by a third party. Um, the development in this community is just not allowing us to free up our existing construction inspectors. They're fully dedicated to uh, development projects. Um, I think of something else. We're carrying a very high contingency. 
And I think it's just a reflection of the market. This estimate was built after the estimates we took on North of Randall Avenue. So um, I hope we can come in cheaper. That's our goal. But uh, the market is very strong right now and getting people just to bid. So I'll be so glad to provide you my full detail takeoff if you'd like to see it. But uh, Well, I think, you know, I don't know how the board feels about any of this, but I think we're just casting about for ways to save money. Uh, you yeah, know, fully, we agree. Um, yeah, yeah. If there's opportunities that our engineer discovers from maybe what I've estimated, clearly we'll, we'll take a look at that and, 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 and implement those. We, uh, uh, if I'm wrong and made a mistake in our estimate here, I'll be the first one to admit it and take the savings and run. Oh, I get that. I'm not trying to throw stones. I'm just, I know. You know it's high. Just, that just seemed like an excessive amount. And in fact, historically, and I, I, somebody would shoot me if they hear me say this, but it is the truth. I'm not saying it's the way it is today. The way we used to do sidewalks is they paid for the materials and we paid everything else. And that's the way the town put in sidewalks. <laughs> So mm -hmm. I'm not saying that's what we should do because I don't want people throwing rocks at my house tonight. But I'm just telling you, way back in history, that's the way it was done. Yeah. Anyway. So what's the cost of the stamping on this project? The cost of the stamping is that, uh, this project is estimated about $52,000. <laughs> okay, thanks. That's the stamping and the crosswalk, the striping, and the milling. Yep, thanks. Thank you, Chris. Yes, sir. Um, and I think that it's important to share that as we bid out this, I mean, something like the stamped uh, crosswalk would be considered an alternative, just as you had with the North of Rendell um, process. So that is something um, we would include as an alternative, and you can choose as we bid it out if you'd like to um, proceed with that scope of work when we contract it. Any other questions? Chris, you went a long way, so you have to come back. Let me first apologize for not um, saying good evening, Mayor, and the and members of the board when I came up here earlier. Um, tonight, we want to talk a little bit about capital facility improvements. And I guess I'll show my age a little bit and tenure here. This has changed drastically over the years. Um, you know, from where I guess back, back in 19, 2007, we looked at the police and the town hall facility. We had about 12,000 square feet. Now when I talk about the police facility and town hall, I talk about 35,000 square feet. So you almost three times a change in square footage that we operate, maintain, and keep up on a daily basis um, in, you know, over the last 10 to 12 years. And so it's just, for me, it's amazing to go back and look and see what we used to do and what we're having to do today. Um, this first slide talks a little bit about that, that transition, that change, that growing up of, 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 of how our community has grown. And now we're looking at five major facilities of town hall, police, the fire station, the public works facilities, and the community center. They range in age from nine years old to 112. Well, I don't believe you'd probably know which one that's nine years old, which is um, the tot lot. But I've got a pretty good, pretty good idea which one the old one is, and that's the building we're standing in today. So um, yeah, that's a wide variety of different systems, different construction methods, uh, different techniques that were used, and uh, we have to adjust for all of that. Um, Town Hall is our largest one at 20,800 square feet. Um, and we maintain almost 73,000 square feet. You know, um, I guess I'll tell another little story and show my age a little bit, but I remember when we used to have to maintain the lawns and the grounds at the police and um, town hall facility. A guy could go up there and do that in 30 minutes. He could take a push mower, a blower, a weed ear, an edger, and knock it all out in 30 minutes. Now to do town hall facility takes a three-man crew all day to accomplish those same tasks. And if I look at those tasks and say, 
Are they reasonable or, and all? I said, yes, that's the same task that each one of us are doing at our house uh, on a weekly basis. So those tasks that we're doing here are very similar to the tasks we're doing at the house, but it's just changed so drastically over time due to the amount of square footage and, your, and uh, acreage at the facility. So uh, just for those who don't recognize this picture, this is a picture from 2008, and that's the entrance to the police station under construction. Um, facility maintenance and all is driven by life, life cycles. And we basically did this report in 2018, June of 2018. It looked at all the facilities, five major facilities in town, and looked at where some of the strengths and weaknesses were and, and kind of projected out what some future needs were. Um, the table to your left, there is a uh, screenshot that's sent from the manual. I'll be glad to give anybody this manual uh, that we have that does not have a copy of it, but it talks about life cycles. And one I point you a little bit to, because we'll be talking to about it in, as we go through these slides, is item number 12, the heat pump and RTU. It talks about useful life of 12 to 14 years. And why that's important is they're recommending changing these units or pieces of equipment out every 12 to 14 years because at that point, the, the depreciation curve, and if you remember some of the presentations from streets, the depreciation curve goes down the longer the years go out. We'll talk about that a little more next week, but it still applies here. The longer something goes out, the higher your maintenance costs are, and higher what your ultimate replacement cost will be. Two projects that we're gonna talk about tonight that are uh, recommended in, in Mr. Moore's budget is police station HVAC. Uh, this facility is right at 15,000 square feet. It has 10 HVAC units on, on the top of the roof or mounted to the side. Uh, five of those were replaced in 2008, 2009 with the renovation. And now they're 14 years old in the next fiscal years. So we are recommending to replace those five noted here. Um, one of the things we are going to do to try to improve efficiency of these units is transition to gas. We have gas on Church Street, um, and rule of thumb is that gas will save you over electricity 30 to 40 percent. So we think this is a good recommended investment long term. We will also, as we go past these five units, knowing there's five more, we're going to size the line appropriately so that when we go to a change out, we just a matter of making that connection at time. We don't have to go back and upsize a distribution line uh, through the facility. Uh, the construction estimate uh, is 77,000. Design allowance, 15.5. Contingency, 20% due to the uncertainty in the market. And with a total project cost of $110,000. Hearing no questions, we'll move to the next oh, item. Oh, I've got questions. Yes, I just yes, wasn't sure if you were. Yes, ma'am. Ready for them. I'm so, sorry. Um, as we saw with the construction of the warming kitchen, mm -hmm. what the project cost was estimated to be was not what the project cost was. I need to feel certain that this contingency is not going to be gone over because I guarantee you it's going to be a problem if you come back to me and ask me for more money because that's what the contingency is for. So yeah. this is the solid number. And in our professional opinion, at the time this estimate was done, I uh, asked our, HD, our uh, electrical, mechanical, and plumbing engineer to help me with these estimates. He provided the construction estimates for us for this project. With that being said, this market is unstable. I recognize your, your comment. Um, I fully recognize it, that it is, we don't need to be coming back. We try to be conservative in our estimates. And for the warming kitchen, in reality, we never used it. So the additional funds that you did allocate, and I appreciate, we, were, we did not end up having to use. So we actually brought that project under budget and returning, I think, over $6,000 that we ended up doing. So it was a safety factor we put in, and thank goodness we didn't have to use it. We have tried to be conservative with these estimates and look at worst case. We've got a lot of experience in this building. Uh, we feel like this is the best, uh, as, a, as a solid estimate, but, um, I give you the most assurance that I can give you. Um, I, I feel confident in the number. I feel confident in our engineer. Um, and, you know, I, our goal is to hit these numbers. We're trying to be conservative. So with moving from electric to gas, the gas units are more expensive? The gas, it's not necessarily the gas units are more expensive. We've got to put the gas piping in place. 
we have to pipe from the piping inside the building and run it along to where these units are and connect to those. I wouldn't say the gas unit was more expensive than electric. It's just the gas piping um, that we have to do to, to fire these units. And then we also have to vent these units to the roof. So there's the additional cost, um, not necessarily the units. But we'll get a return on investment from our electricity bill going down. When do you expect to see the return on investment for the additional expenditure? Typically, return on investment, something like this, is probably five or six years. Okay, thank you. Good questions. Thank you. Any others? Hearing none, we'll go to the next item recommended in uh, Mr. Moore's budget is the Public Works Equipment Storage uh, Building. Um, this is a 2,400 square foot facility. Um, some of you may remind, uh, remember we had previously designed this project. We have built the pad. We have relocated the fence. We relocated utilities in 2018. Uh, just to give you a little bit of cost reference, in 2009, we built the, when we were building the community center, we built the Parks and Rec maintenance facility. It's 2,400 square feet now. It's a little bit different. Um, it does have some finished uh, condition space in it and it has two lean-tos in it, but I thought it was a good reference for the amount of square footage and the size that you may see since you have, um, everybody's been to that location. So um, it is a much needed facility. It is a facility, our existing maintenance building was uh, built in 1987 by Mr. Don Horton, who was the town manager at the time. Um, it's been over 35 years. We've seen significant growth in the public works uh, department since then. Um, some of our concerns are, are clearly safety. When we try to egress and put equipment in and protect from weather, weather we do not have appropriate egress paths. We're constantly moving equipment around for my fleet mechanic to make room to make repairs. Um, we got storage at multiple facilities. It is just time for us to make that investment. It's kind of like we made, it was time for us to make that investment transition from the police station to our current station in town hall here. It's time to make some investment at Public Works. Um, I would, there's several of you that probably have never been to a Public Works facility. I would love to extend an invitation to you to walk that. I'd like to show you that. It's one thing for me to sit here and tell you about the challenges we have, but for me to walk and show you those challenges and let you speak to my, some of my staff, I think that's when you'll get the greatest understandings of some of the challenges we work through daily. So my invitation is extended today to each and every one of you to come walk with us, contact myself or Mr. Moore, and we'll be glad to arrange something for that to give you a better feel for where it's going. I know that several of the commissioners have been asking for tours of the facilities. So thank you for that invitation since up until this point, uh, we haven't been invited to do so. COVID has put a little bit of restrictions on a few things we wanted to do for several of you new commissioners. Uh, I think now is the perfect time when it, some of those things being led up is to get you out and about and show you some of our facilities and show you some of our challenges and some of the things we are blessed that you have given us. So um, like I say, work with Joe or call myself and we'll be glad to do individual tours, group tours, whatever works best for this group. But we um, currently invite everyone to our, our location. Um, any questions? I guess we'll stop there and pause a moment. Okay. Hearing none, we'll talk about uh, a couple of the items like Joe mentioned that are uh, unfunded. Um, just to give you a little bit of reference, that picture was taken in 2007, right after we purchased this building. That is Baker Roofing putting a new roof on this structure here. That was. Uh, for those who wasn't here, the first project we did on the police building and the town hall building was place the roof because they were leaking. So we tried to stop some of the water infiltration with, that we inherited. So uh, those roofs went on in 2007, late 2007, early 2008. A um, couple of the unfunded uh, pieces that we were just unable to fund with this year's budget. Uh, we talked about a little bit of, uh, uh, a moment ago about the existing maintenance facility that we have at Public Works. It's basically remained untouched um, over the last 34 years, and it's just needed some general repairs and stuff. Uh, we've listed a few of these here. I don't want to spend a lot of time on them, but if you do come to the door, we can talk a little more about that. But they're estimated at about $260,000. A couple of other items that are unfunded. Uh, some filling station upgrades. We're currently working on 
uh, software that runs the pedestal and dispenses gas to our police, our fire, and all our town vehicles from 2004. We've got uh, pedestals that are 2009 and 12 with a typical useful life for 10 to 12 years. So it's just time to make some investment into our fueling station. A couple other items to look at is we'd love to do some seal coating and what we call preservation uh, maintenance on asphalt parking lots and stuff. Uh, we think there's also some aesthetic benefits. And then as we continue to grow, we need to look at uh, maintenance yard expansion at Public Works. Um, future needs that are out there that are coming in the future, uh, coming years, Community Center has 10 HVAC units. They were all put in in 2009. They're getting to be 13 years old, so we're hitting that useful life again. That currently is estimated at about 165,000. Um, Pub workshop roof has a warranty of a coating on it that expires next year. Um, if we did some of the renovations mentioned on the earlier slide, that would take care of it. But if we broke it out and did it separately, the, the um, public works roof uh, recoding would be approximately 35 grand. Uh, maintenance building at the Parks and Rec facility needs some uh, coating uh, work done on it. And then uh, we'd also like to see ultimately a town hall dumpster pad. And that wraps up my capital facilities uh, presentation. Be glad to answer any questions. Um, and like again, love to extend the invitation to come to Public Works. Thank you. Didn't you really, uh, really, originally <laughs> propose like a non-enclosed shelter? Yes, sir. And then came along and said it needed to be enclosed. Yes, sir. But my thinking was that it was bigger than a 2,600 square foot footprint. Am I wrong on that? Uh, they were very similar in, in square footage. I know, and just to refresh your, your memory, we were looking at an open three-sided facility. Uh, as we got closer to that, we done some site um, long-range planning and stuff and recognized that our administrative building would have to go where we were proposing this building. As you know, you want to turn this building where it's facing against the north wind, and so the wind and, and snow and rain is not blowing on the equipment. We were unable to accomplish that. And so uh, that's when we shifted and changed to go to an enclosed building and change the location. Yeah. Okay, I just was thinking it was bigger <coughs> than, uh, yes, than 2,600. 24, but yes, sir. Well, whatever. Yeah, I know, <laughs> yeah. Okay, yes, thank you. Yes, sir. Any other questions, concerns? Thank you, guys. Have a good evening. Good evening. Um, tonight, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, general fund, fund balance. Uh, first, I'm going to start off with a sort of review of uh, June 30, 2020 numbers, then kind of roll into some projections for uh, June 30, 21. Um, if you have any questions throughout, just holler. Just let me know. Um, as I said, first of all, we're going to look at uh, June 30, 2020. Um, if you look at your CAFR, uh, this is on Exhibit 3, page 26, also known as the balance sheet, uh, is where you can find uh, these figures. Um, first of all, total fund balance uh, at June 30, 2020, uh, was a little over $12 million. Of that, a little over $10 million was unrestricted. Uh, what's unrestricted is the uh, committed, assigned, and unassigned. Uh, just a refresher, committed, these are things such as stadium, capital improvements, uh, fleet. These are uh, portions of fund balance that were put into quote unquote reserves uh, for specific uses. They're put in there by or put in or taken out by ordinance or resolution. Um, to give you that exact number, uh, that uh, yellow portion is about 828,000. Um, the assigned portion is the lighter green. Uh, that's the 1.9 million that was appropriated uh, in, in the FY21 original budget. And then the unassigned portion is kind of the, the free of any other restrictions or commitments. Uh, that's was seven, almost 7.3 million almost. 
And then our policy is 50% of unrestricted, or excuse me, our, it must be 50% of projected expenditures. Well, 50% of our uh, original FY21 budget was the 6,777,000 that you see there. Uh, when you're talking about um, fund balance as it relates to our bond rating and uh, what do we need to do to keep and achieve and keep a favorable bond rating, uh, you see here the methodology from Moody's. Uh, we've, some of you have heard this before, but uh, we'll go over it again. 30% of it is based on uh, finances. And then 30% is based on the economy and the tax base. Uh, there's about 13 categories that make up this 100%. Uh, most of them are five to ten. They're either five or ten percent per uh, of those thirteen categories. Of the uh, finance sub factor, ten percent of that uh, thirty is made up of uh, fund balance as a percentage of operating revenues. To get a triple A worthy score, you have to have uh, greater than thirty percent. This is basically uh, the scorecard, like the, the scoring methodology for all of those categories. Um, what you want to do here is you want to have a low score. To have a triple A score, you want to have like a 0.5 or so. Um, so the higher your score, the, the lower your, your rating's going to be. So here's kind of, if you're triple A, you can be in between uh, 0.5 and 1.5 in the category, and so on, as you see there. If you look at some of our history, this is the, the key component of uh, fund balance as a percentage of operating revenues. And you look at the last nine years, you see that, that uh, dotted white line across <coughs> there? That's the 30% that we need to achieve um, the AAA uh, rating in this category. Um, you'll see the, the red bars, those are our actuals for the last nine years. Uh, you'll see we're well above uh, the AAA requirement, and the U.S. median. The U.S. median is that green line, uh, green dotted line there that you see. Um, this is an excerpt from our last um, issue or comment from April of 2020. Uh, it says the town has a robust financial position, which is a strength relative to a signed rating of AA3. The fund balance as a percentage of operating revenues is far above the U.S. median. Moreover, Zebulon's cash balance as a percentage of operating revenues is far superior to other Moody's rated cities nationwide. So now we're going to take a look at my projections for June 30, 21 numbers. You see here, I have a projection of about 12.9 million on the total fund balance. Of that, about uh, just shy of 11 million would be would fall into the unrestricted categories. And then, based on the uh, recommended budget of the uh, 15 million and change, that would put our 50% floor uh, based on our policy at about uh, 7.5 million. Uh, just a reminder, here is uh, your, your current fund balance policy. The key components in that policy uh, basically says your unrestricted fund balance uh, is to be greater than 50% of your total uh, projected expenditures. Uh, again, that uh, unrestricted fund balance, that is everything but the restricted. That's committed, assigned, and unassigned. And anything in excess of 50% uh, can be appropriated for uh, expenditure in that next year's budget. So if you come back here to this graph, you'll see about uh, 3.4 um, is basically the unrestricted minus the fund balance policy. That leaves you about 3.4 million available for appropriation. Any 
Anybody have any questions? How much of that three, and I should, I've seen it in here, but I can't remember. It was something over two million was appropriated, right? Right. Uh, or projected to be appropriated. I think it was 2.1. I knew it was yeah. somewhere in that, that range. So then that would leave us uh, 1.3. Pardon? About 1. Point, you mean above the remaining yeah, unrestricted fund balance? Million, yeah. Would be, I'm sorry. 1.3 million would be still available. Okay. Above what we okay. have. Okay. Uh, I follow you. Okay. One thing that I really want to look for, and I, I have not done it yet, <coughs> is unrestricted or is fund balance sub, uh, subsidizing operations as opposed to uh, hard items, if you will, uh, capital projects, that sort of thing. In other words, are, is it being used to fund any recurring type expenses? Are you asking if we are? If you want to answer it, yeah, sure. Yeah, I think uh, this year, I think typically no. I think this year is uh, 30,000, I think, of that is uh, operating uh, expenditure. But typically, there's not been any subsidization, subsidy um, for operations. If, if you could give us that information in that format that you know, here's what it is, here's, you know, what you're projecting to spend, here's what's projected to be left, and how those percentages, you know, relate. Um, that would be very important to me. Now, I can dig through here and do it myself, uh, but you probably got it more at your fingertips than I do. All right. Okay. Okay. Other questions? Yeah, what happened in 2018 that caused our expenditures in 19 to go down where our general fund balance dropped to 73. Okay, yeah, yeah. I forgot to mention that. Um, yeah, that in uh, 19, that's when we did the installment purchase on the fire trucks. So lease purchase proceeds are counted as operating revenues, so that kind of skewed the revenues up and thus our percentage down. Okay. So that, I meant to mention that, but yeah, that's that's why the, it's a little bit. Cause we're typically around 85, but 85 to 90. Other questions? I, I'm curious on this median number. Is that for all municipalities, regardless of size? Yes. Do you have available what the median number would be for, say, cities under 10? That, my, and I tell you why. Uh, and, and I really get hung up on phone balance. Y'all know that. So, and I'm not trying to be combative. I just really want some information. One, I'm glad it's not proposed to go below 50%. But my understanding is that the smaller the town, usually the higher the fund balance is. Mm -hmm. So I don't think looking at this median number is fair in comparison of the, the market that we deal with. Right. Uh, so the, it, I just wonder, because I know over time I ran across various uh, small municipal governments that actually had over 100% in fund balance. I'm not saying that's what they should have or should not have done, but that's the way it was. So I'd kind of like to compare us more to mm -hmm. something in our size. And I say under 10, I think that's a fair mark. but. Uh, I don't know how readily available it is. I can ask. I understand. Them. And I if it's not, them. I don't expect you to spend a ton of time on it. Yeah. But you know, I, I want it on the table. My philosophy on fund balance has basically been to have a much higher fund balance because we had a much higher uh, commercial tax base, right. and you can lose a Glaxo and really get whacked, or you can lose a house and you can survive it very easily. So I personally, this is just my personal thing, tried to keep our fund balance somewhere in the ratio of commercial to residential. Now, 
I, I recognize that that's changing, and that's a good thing because we better, we're better balanced. But I just want you to understand where I was coming from all these years on phone balance. Yeah, I'll check with them. Um, this is their number. These are these are Moody rated municipalities and everything. So right. they may have a breakdown of. Well, I don't expect you to spend a lot of time on it, Bob. It'd be something I'd be very interested in. Okay. Uh, I'll see what I can but, find out. You know, if it's a lot of trouble, yeah. I can live without it. I just, you know. Okay. Other questions anybody have? Bobby, you always ask act as the budget officer, right? Joe is the budget officer. Joe is, but you're the one that gives us the reports of the comings and goings of the five thousand dollar amounts. In the month? Oh yes, yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay. Anything else? Anyone? Okay, Don. Thank you. Thank you. Public, but for the record, I will ask if there's any public that would like to speak. And seeing none, we'll move to questions, comments, and requests. Joe? Let me just check it. Stacey, did you receive anything by email? I did not. Okay. So, yes, any questions or comments or requests that we can try to answer tonight or come back at your third work session prepared to answer? We've already received some stuff that we'll come back with, but. Anything else? All right, Joe, manager's report. All right, so for your third work session, we will have a presentation on the parks and recreation capital projects. We'll give you a little bit of an update on where your parks and recreation master plan is, but you'll, you'll discuss your master plan and you'll receive that at your um, August meetings. You'll also receive at the third work session a presentation on uh, streets and thoroughfares, and we are going to talk um, in a little bit more detail about an unfunded project, but we need to start sharing uh, with you information on the results of the comprehensive market study that we initiated this past year. Of course, we'll have a time for um, public input as well, and then any questions, comments, or requests resulting from that meeting that we would then report back at the June 7th uh, budget public hearing. And that concludes our presentation. Okay. Well, thank you. That was efficient and fast. So, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. We're adjourned.